Welcome back to the Gundam Retrospective. Last time we took a look at the first arc of Mobile Suit Gundam Age. Known as the Flit arc and covering the first 15 episodes of the show, it wasn't necessarily a bad time despite some pacing and tone issues. In fact, I rather enjoyed the conclusion to that arc and I think that it does a lot to build up some goodwill leading into the first time skip. Just to clear up any questions, this video is part 2 of 2, and we will be discussing the rest of the series, the Asamu, Kyo, and Triple Gundam arcs that make up the rest of the show's runtime. So because of that, I'm not going to do a long intro about the history of the show, I'm just going to point you in the direction of the first video, where I went over a lot of that background setup stuff. So without further ado, Let's jump right back in to Mobile Suit Gundam Age. 25 years after the Battle of Ambat, Flit Asano is now a Lieutenant General in the Federation Armed Forces, with cool facial hair to boot. The war with Mars is still raging, however instead of them being some unknown force, we now know them as the Vagan, a civilization of colonists abandoned on Mars by the Federation in times past. 25 years of rising through the ranks of the Federation has done nothing to quell Flit's hatred of the Vagan, and it will be illustrated time and time again that he basically is all in on destroying every single one of them. At the same time, Flit also has a family with his wife Emily. His son Asamu has just turned 17, and Flit decides it's time for his son to become a man and follow in his footsteps. Asamu receives the age device from his father, but we don't really get the feeling that he's all in on becoming a soldier like his dad. There's also a freak in Asamu's high school class named Zayhart Galette, who's definitely not an alien. We see him on a communication device talking about how his infiltration of the colony is complete, and it seems that his goal is to locate and destroy the Age 1 Gundam. Of course, the Gundam isn't very far, being hidden in the barn at Asimu's house, though he only learns of this himself when he's forced to pilot it against the invading Vagan forces. At first, Asimu is pretty clumsy in the Gundam, but I do like how his fighting style is immediately distinct from Flit's during the first arc. Asimu tends to prefer hand-to-hand -hand combat and often dual wields beam sabers in combination with the suit's boosters to overpower opponents up close. It sets him apart and makes his fights pretty fun to watch, as I prefer the chunkier melee fights to the one-hit beam weapon kills present elsewhere in Age. The Federation Defense Forces fight off the Vagan alongside Asimu, and things quickly go back to normal, though the war definitely seems closer to home. Zayhart is now convinced that the Gundam Age 1 is hidden at the Asano estate, so he joins the school's mobile suit club to get closer to Asimu. He achieves this through the use of a musical montage, which that kind of seems sort of rushed in episode 2, but this is Gundam Age and we do not have time to mess around. We get the feeling that Zayhart is growing closer to Asimu and the others and might actually see them as friends, but he meets his Vagan contact, a guy named Daz who sort of looks like Professor Oak, and it reinvigorates him to achieve his mission. Zayhart pushes for a mobile suit club meeting at Asimu's house and is able to find the Gundam, then lead an assault on the location to capture the suit. This causes Flit to move it to a government facility, which it probably should have been in from the beginning. Asimu's class finally graduates, but during the ceremony, the Federation military police burst in and arrest Zayhart for being a Vagan spy. This shocks Asimu and he wholeheartedly defends his friend, thinking that there's no way he could be an enemy. Daz shows up and fires a gun at the MPs, which causes them to have video game guard intelligence and totally forget about Zayhart. Despite being conflicted because of his friendship with Asimu, Zayhart decides it is time to put his plan into action and boards his hidden mobile suit. He fights Asimu and the Gundam, with the two exiting their suits. Zayhart tells Asimu that there are just some people in this world that shouldn't fight, and he lets him live before fleeing as the defense forces show up. With this betrayal, Asimu decides that he is going to join the Federation military, and despite following in his father's footsteps, he still wants to step out from his shadow. 
Not exactly a unique character goal, but hey, it's something. Zehart is made commander of the Earth Occupation Forces because the Vagan are pretty much done with just hitting random colonies, and they're now in the process of planning a full-on invasion. Asimu is then assigned to the Diva, where he meets his fellow pilots. Most important among the bunch is a girl named Arisa Gunhale, the daughter of that little fat kid DK from the first arc. I say the most important kind of sarcastically because this arc is basically the Asimu and Flit show. Characters like Arisa have a few moments here and there, but mostly fade into the background, which is a shame because I like her design and general characterization, it's just that they don't give the other pilots very much to do. Also, I've seen some people translate her name directly into Elisa. I'm not going to do that because I watch the Japanese and I don't care. There's also a guy named Obright who pretty much takes up the same role as Largan in Act 1, but he has a bowl cut and a crush on Remy, one of the Diva mobile suit mechanics. Wolf is also here as a veteran mobile suit commander, and now he has really cool sideburns. Asimu has to deal with a bunch of the other soldiers on board the Diva, thinking he's getting special treatment because he's the son of the base commander. Yeah, like I said, Flit has really climbed the ranks of the Federation in the past 25 years, and he is now in charge of the Federation forces defending the space base, Big Ring. Asimu gets to meet his brand new mobile suit in the Diva's hangar, the transforming Gundam Age 2. As far as the designs of the main mobile suits go in Age, the Age 2 is probably my favorite. I find the Age 1 to be a fun throwback to the original RX-78, but man, the Age 2 is just so clean. It has elements of the Zeta Gundam and even the Wing Gundam in there, and even though transforming mobile suits have never really been my favorite in their respective series, the Age 2 is just a perfect upgrade from the Age 1 in this art style. The Diva is intercepted by a Vagan recon squad while en route to Big Ring, and this is the perfect place to show that Asimu kinda sucks. I mean, he's proficient at flying a mobile suit, but he has no idea about military engagement and has to be taught things like line of fire as he almost blasts the D.Va. Of course, Asimu thinks that he knows better than the people that are giving him orders and advice, and despite taking out two Vagan mobile suits during the battle, he's thrown in the brig for insubordination. On the Vagan side of things, Zehart tests out a brand new suit called the Zetas R, which does not live up to his expectations. We meet a grown Dezel who is just as psycho as he was when he was a child, and we're told that the X-Rounders are being awoken, so this must be the start of a huge Vagan plan. One thing that's pretty interesting about the Asimu arc is that we get to learn a lot about the Vagan through the eyes of Zehart. While they do more later on to try and make the Martians more sympathetic, in this arc we're mostly introduced to their military structure and general cutthroat atmosphere that they live in. Also, they have some pretty cool tech and even use cryogenic freezing to keep their ace pilots in peak fighting form. Oh yeah, and since we can't get through a Gundam show without a masked pilot, Zehart is given some headgear that is supposed to help control his X-Rounder powers. Whatever, it's, it's a contrived reason to make him this show's Char clone. Zehart wastes no time testing out his new mobile suit on the D.Va. While Wolf and the others try to help Asimu, they are eventually pulled away by waves of Vagan mobile suits. Asimu can tell that the pilot of the red suit is Zehart by the way it moves, and he goes against Wolf's orders to pull back and defend the D.Va. Asimu chases Zehart at full speed in a fight that's really visually impressive. We even get a beam clash as both Zehart and Asimu fire their rifles at each other. Zehart super kicks the Age 2 into an asteroid, but he can't bring himself to kill his friend and just leaves Asimu alive. I like how perceptive Dezel is here, as he can tell that Zehart didn't destroy the Gundam, and even holds that fact over Zehart's head, that evil little goblin hasn't changed. The D.Va finally arrives at Big Ring, and while they were originally going to head to Earth, uh, they're now assigned to help defend the base. Flit has gotten intelligence that the Vagan are going to attack in force, but the crew has some time to kill while they wait. 
Asamu is like super excited to take this advanced pilot training course that can determine his aptitude as a possible X-rounder. And people still talk about Asamu as if he's getting special treatment, so he's doubly determined to prove his worth. He's so excited to get those test results back, only to find that he scored a big fat D on X-rounder aptitude. I mean, it, at least it's not an F. As they say, Ds get degrees. Wolf gets tired of him moping around pretty quickly and takes him to Madorna Workshop, where we meet Madorna and his son Rody. Rody and Asimu hit it off pretty quick, as they both feel the stress of having to live up to their famous fathers. Wolf's solution to getting Asimu his mojo back is to put him in a simulator against two opponents modeled after the Age 1 at the Battle of Ambat and Zayhart's most recent suit. Wolf tells Asimu that if he isn't an X-Rounder, then he has to stop trying to move like one and has to come up with his own way of fighting. It's some nice progression on Asimu's character arc. Not only is he emotionally stepping out from Flit's shadow, but so is his skill as he physically progresses into becoming a better pilot. Asimu starts to realize that he can't rely on X-Rounder abilities like other pilots he might face, so he has to just be really, really good at doing it himself. I always really appreciate when a character has to overcome new types through skill. It just feels great when Sunrise does this right, and as far as Asimu goes, I think they do a really good job in that aspect. As the Federation fleet prepares for the arrival of the Vagan, we see that Zayhart was inspired as a child by the leader of the Mars people. This man, Lord Ezelkent, has only been heard of in brief mentions up until this point, and even now he doesn't really get time to shine until arc number three. Zayhart sees him as a kind and strong leader, someone who has been able to lead the Vagan through many generations thanks to their cryogenic freezing technology. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but <laughs> there's a grocery store next door, and uh, every day, one of the employees, their car alarm goes off, um, well, from basically their entire shift, so uh, I'm just going to crack one open until that's over so I can continue talking about Gundam. Thank you very much. Can't you get your car broken into on your own time? Zayhart sends out the elite X-Rounder Corps, known as the Magician's Eight, to deal with the Federation, but quick thinking from Flit and his second-in-command, Alcreus, sees the enemy aces surrounded and cut off. Zayhart and Dezel then head out personally and waste no time locating and engaging Wolf and Asimu. Flit also joins the battle after getting fed up sitting on the base and immediately comes up with a plan that gets Dezel cut to pieces. The Vagan doesn't die, but he's really upset. In fact, just fighting Flit pretty much made him lose his mind. Every time that Flit and Dezel fight in the show, it's a spectacle to be sure. Zayhart is forced to give the order to retreat after realizing that they've lost way too many troops, and despite winning the day, Flit blows Asimu off. Flint was a kid that was single-minded back in Arc 1, but that stubbornness has ballooned now, and he really does not give a shit about being a parent to Asimu, even though it probably isn't the best time to be giving out pats on the back anyway. It's just kind of sad to see Asimu desperately want his father's acknowledgement and Flit could just not give a shit. But it is more than Flit just being distracted by the ongoing war. Even his direct subordinates kind of look at him with worried glances as he talks about how much he hates the Vagan. It's obviously a heavy weight upon his soul. Flit himself is now aboard the Diva, using it as his unofficial flagship. They're heading towards a colony called Solon, where Flit suspects a local company of assisting the Vagan. On the way, we get to see Obride interacting with Remy some more, and, um, well, let's just say there's a reason why he likes her, and this show is very interested in showing you why. Despite other characters like Arisa having pretty much nothing to do besides slap Asimu's ass when he's feeling down about his dad, yes, that happens, they do devote time to Remy and Obrite, which seems suspicious, but I'm sure it'll be fine. Now we get a really great episode where the D.Va performs an inspection of a colony, and Wolf gets to play spy and run around the facility. He finds a bunch of vague and mobile suits in the hangar, but is then spotted and has to escape in the coolest way possible, because he's Wolf, damn it. 
Wolf and Milius escape in a jeep and are saved by the diva's mobile suits. The fighting spills over into the city, which is exactly what Asimu was afraid of happening. He spends this episode not wanting to take part in the operation because it might put civilians in danger, but also he makes it into a big argument with his dad in front of everyone, so it just looks really immature. He finally decides to help fight off the Vagan forces when he realizes he can't just let them run amok in the city, and is then thrown in the brig for acting like a little bitch, basically. And, oh, and also the entire company building explodes, and they don't really explain what happened to any of the employees, so uh, hooray for collateral damage, I guess. Like, yeah, most of them were probably vegan spies, but was the janitor that was contracted out by a third-party sanitation service ready to die for the cause? Flit meets an old badass Grodic at a bar. The guy's been in prison for almost three decades, and now he arrives back on the scene to pass some information to the commander. It would seem that Grodek knows someone in the Federation is a traitor, and he'll return later with the proof. Asimu takes some time for self-reflection as he walks around the city. He still struggles with really knowing what he's fighting for, and his constant anxiety about not being an X-rounder has caused self-confidence issues time and time again. Zayhart suddenly shows up in the park and tells Asimu to leave the military and go back to being the friend he remembers him as. And Zayhart even pulls a gun on him in a bid to get Asimu to give up fighting, but then Romery shows up and... In the distraction, Asimu is able to disarm the Vagan commander. He tells her to contact the Federation and tell them that he's captured a Vagan spy, but she refuses because she still thinks of Zayhart as a friend. Which is really frustrating because stopping him now would cause like 30 more years of fighting to possibly end. Anyway, Zayhart escapes and he gets in his mobile suit which he had hidden in a nearby pond. How the fuck did he get that in there without anybody noticing? And does that mean that Asimu walked by this mobile suit's hiding spot by accident? Because props to Zayhart, if he hid that there while Asimu was standing there and Asimu didn't notice, that is some G Gundam like hide the robot in the Statue of Liberty stealth. The Diva's mobile suits then chase Zayhart out of the colony and they have a skirmish with the Magician's Eight. Asimu gets equipped with the new Age 2 Double Bullet, which is probably the coolest kit for this particular suit. He basically gets Freedom Gundam Beam Spam and Giant Beam Sabers. Despite Asimu's self-confidence issues, he ends up defeating a few enemy pilots in combat, and Zayhart has to order a retreat. Flit returns to the bar to get the information from Grodek, but the old soldier is stabbed outside by the son of Girazol, who is then shot to death by government G-Men. Damn, man, uh, Grodek is pretty resigned to his fate, too. At least he's able to delete the evidence off his data pad before he dies, making it so no one would be suspicious of Flint. The Diva recovers a mysterious Vagan helmet from the wreckage of a mobile suit, and DK discovers that it amplifies X-Rounder powers. He tells Asimu not to mess around with it because it could also give him brain damage, but do you think he's gonna listen to that? When the Magicians 8 and Dezel show up to take revenge for their fallen comrades, Asimu doesn't believe that he can fight them, so he grabs the helmet. We also see Flit is such a powerful X-Rounder that he's able to fire the Diva's weapons accurately enough to hit Dezel's mobile suit, which is like something that almost never happens in Gundam. DK does catch Asimu with the helmet and locks it up, telling him not to use it, but then he just sort of leaves Asimu alone with it, so the kid just smashes that shit open and takes it. Asimu joins the battle, saving a couple of the other pilots. He then fights and kills one of the Magician's Eight named Leo, and disarms the other one named Mink. Again, the double trigger is really cool in combat, and the Magician's Eight all have such good facial expressions and reaction shots that I can't help but love it. Wolf also gets one of the sickest kills in the entire series here. The helmet starts causing Asimu terrible pain, and he screams and then passes out. And then after this, they just never talk about the helmet or bring it up ever again. Wolf tells him to stop trying to become an X-Rounder, focus on becoming a super pilot like himself instead. And you know, that's a really valid point because Wolf is not an X-Rounder, but he's never had trouble keeping up with anybody. In fact, he's like smoking dudes left and right. 
The Vagan plan to use a colony called Nortrum as an FOB for their Earth invasion. The Federation defends the colony with a new weapon called the Photon Ring, which requires the D.Va to fire its main gun first as sort of a tracer aiming shot. Wolf and Asimu fight Dezel during the battle, and Wolf ends up taking a beam saber to the cockpit in order to save Asimu. He tells the young pilot to become the best super pilot in all of space, and I'm pretty sad to see him go. Wolf is probably my favorite character in the entire series, and more of a father figure to Asimu than Flit is. Asimu swears to avenge his mentor, and then cuts Dezel in half and shoots him, for good measure. Flit realizes that the Vagan fleet isn't actually trying to destroy the colony, so he orders everyone to go on the offensive and attack the enemy flagship, and then he launches in the Age 1 himself. Flit personally takes command of Wolf's team, but before they can all rendezvous, Asimu engages Zayhart. Daz also shows up again and grapples onto the Age 1, severely damaging it by self-destructing. The Vagan fortress is hit by the Photon Blaster, which takes out its propulsion system, which seems good until you realize it's heading directly towards Earth and could do a ton of damage to the planet. The fortress like runs in to the D.Va and it, it gets stuck to it like a fly on a windshield. Uh, and they plan on using the photon blaster to dislodge themselves, but there's like a piece of debris in the way. So this is where Remy decides to take a mobile worker and go and clear the blockage. She manages to accomplish this, but she's shot by Mink and dies. This death just feels kind of mean, especially when you realize they only focused on Obright's relationship with her so that they could kill her later and get some sad points. Both Asimu and Zayhart do not want the Earth to be damaged, and desperately decide to enter the fortress and blow its reactor. They meet up and end up working together. Just as you think they're trapped, Zayhart hears a voice telling him he has more work to do, and an escape route opens for them. Seems like someone has a plan for Zayhard in the future. Asimu is almost crushed by a falling piece of the colony, but Zayhard saves him and falls into the atmosphere for his efforts. He's caught by Dole, the leader of the Magician's Aid, who finally believes in him, though I don't think Dole survives atmospheric reentry because his mobile suit is really damaged. Sometime later, Asimu has repainted the Age 2 in white in honor of Wolf, and damn, it looks really nice. During a speech by the Federation's Prime Minister, Alphanoa, Flit arrives on stage with a bunch of soldiers and accuses him of treason. The leader of the Fetis was providing information to the Vagan the entire time, but Flit assures him that he won't let the Vagan come and kill him. A cool suit shows up piloted by a man named Metal Zant, and is killed by Asimu before he can assassinate Alphanoa. So the Prime Minister gets to live, for now, because Flit then has him executed for treason. And then he leads a committee that rounds up all of the Vagan sympathizers and completely reorganizes the Federation government. Overall, I really like the Asimu arc of Mobile Suit Gundam Age. While a lot of people think that the school stuff at the beginning drags, I wasn't really all that bothered by it. It does a pretty good job setting up Asimu and Zayhart's relationship, and it leads to a great rivalry between the two for the following 15 episodes. Also, Zayhart really needs that setup at the start, or else his character would not work later on. Uh, I still don't think he works very well anyway in the upcoming arc, but it'd be even worse. Asimu is my favorite protagonist in the series, and I think his need to live up to his father's reputation is just a really relatable character arc. Plus, I always like it when we get a main character who has to deal with new type powers without having any themselves. I also like how it shows us Flit's progression into a military tactician, but also just sort of an asshole overall. Since we know Flit's backstory, it makes it easy to sympathize with him, even if you don't agree with how he's doing things. The story jumps ahead to AG-164, and we meet our new protagonist, the youngest of the three and most precious, I guess, Kyo Asano. Where Asimu had a pretty strained relationship with his father, Kyo doesn't really have to worry about that because Asimu disappeared on a mission right after Kyo was born. 
Arc 3 takes no time getting right into the action, as the city Keo lives in is attacked by invading Vagan forces, and a giant hologram of Ezelkent appears declaring the official invasion of Earth. Grandpa Flit shows up and is way nicer to Keo than he was to Asimu, but that is a very grandfatherly thing, I guess. He reveals that he's been training Keo to fly the new Gundam Age 3 under the guise of playing a video game. Kind of fucked up thing to do, Grandpa. Keo is an extremely powerful X-Rounder, just touching the age device, which was recovered from the area that Asimu went missing in, gives him a premonition. The Age 3 is also a pretty great design, and it even uses a core fighter and docking system. It's a pretty huge machine and it gives me double Zeta vibes right off the bat. The Vagans show up with this giant weapon that sort of looks like a bunch of balls in space. They completely destroy Big Ring in one giant shot. Everyone scrambles to mount a defense and they even send out the Diva, which at this point is super old. The D.Va is even crewed by a bunch of troublemakers and amateurs. The Federation doesn't really seem to care about staffing it. The captain is a very nervous woman named Natora Anus. Yes, uh, it is pronounced that way. It says so on the Gundam wiki. Who is given a field promotion and is constantly worried about screwing up and killing everyone. Kia watches as the Vagan bomb a city and slaughter a bunch of civilians. He, along with the Diva's mobile suit crew, led by a man named Sarek Abyss, are able to drive back the Vagan ship and even a returning Zehart. Keo, angered by the fact that the Vagan are just slaughtering civilians, vows to defeat the Vagan in the Diva's hangar, much like his grandfather did all those years ago. The Diva now travels from a city in Alaska called Oliver Notes to a place in South America called Rostralan. And it wouldn't be Gundam without some shenanigans in the middle of the desert, now would it? Uh, and also, Flit is on board and he's kind of taking Natora under his wing. He's pretty much retired, but the military kind of lets him do whatever he wants, especially now that his former second-in-command, Agrius, is an admiral. On board the ship is this little shit kid named Wootbit, He's the son of Arisa, and he acts like a little asshole for an episode, literally assaulting Keo just because he doesn't like him. He's super protective of Rhodey, who is returning from Mark II, to be the mechanic of the D.Va. These three enemy pilots, nicknamed the Ghosts of the Desert, hunt down the D.Va, and one of them ends up dying in the battle. Keo celebrates his win after shooting down an enemy suit, but one of the other pilots, named Shanalua, tells him it's not okay to celebrate killing people. And they start focusing on her a lot, and we learn that she's actually a vegan spy to get money for her sick sister. And they try really hard to make her sympathetic, but she's literally a traitor that works with people performing a genocide on the Earth, so I, I don't really care about her, to be honest. Keo tries really hard to convince her not to be a traitor, even to the point where she is threatening to kill him if he doesn't leave. Like... I get that you're trying to help your sister, like you're Joey Wheeler, but you're threatening to kill children now. But then she dies taking out a vegan suit that was about to dust Keo, so... Oh well. I don't know, I, I think this arc starts showing a lot of problems here. It's absolutely possible to make a sympathetic villain. I mean, the original Mobile Suit Gundam and its sequels do a pretty good job of humanizing Zeon. But here, it just sort of feels like theater. Like, they wrote themselves into a hole with the Vagan being so evil up until now that no matter what they do, it's really hard to side with them. Let me remind everyone that they are introduced by showing up and completely destroying civilian colonies unprovoked. When the D.Va finally arrives at Rostraland, they discover that a mobile suit team led by Zayhart has planted a bunch of bombs inside and are retreating. Keo has a really good fight with Zayhart, who is surprised at his rage and power, but he has to leave before killing the Vagan commander in order to help with the bombs. Keo is such a good X-Rounder that he's able to find the bomb just in the nick of time, saving the base from destruction. The crew of the D.Va are then told that they're going to the moon in order to help in the war, and that the Earth's orbit, along with 40% of its surface, is under Vagan control. 
The diva passes through a sector of space known as Sargasso, a location with a bunch of shipwrecks and space junk floating around. It's even explained that there's a bunch of ice particles floating around here so it makes it all misty. It's a pretty cool place to be attacked by space pirates, I guess. The diva is hailed by the Basidian space pirates and are told to surrender or die, and the diva obviously sends its mobile suits out to fight. Kyo runs into the totally not Asamu pirate Captain Ash, who has a retooled H2 with pirate hook hands. This version of the suit is called the Dark Hound, and it's pretty damn cool. We definitely do not get pirate themed mobile suits often enough. The fight between the pirates and the diva is interrupted by Vagan suits led by the remaining desert ghosts. Asamu saves Kyo and tells the Vagan not to mess with a super pilot, and then he fires a device onto the H3 before refusing to tell Kyo who he is and leaving. On the pirate ship, Asumu reveals that his plan was to steal the age system, but only if he decided the diva was unworthy of using it. On the diva, we get to see that Obright, still one of the ship's pilots, takes his time personally sweeping the hangar by hand, something that Remy used to do back in Art 2. So there's the payoff for her character arc, it's kind of sad, but I guess they did something with it. They discover that the device stuck to the age 3 is a message capsule containing information on something called the ExaDB. The ExaDB is a compiled database of all the advanced tech and weaponry that was abandoned at the end of the Colony Wars long ago. Asimu has discovered that Ezelkent at one point found a piece of the ExaDB after the Mars colony was abandoned by the Federation, leading to their advanced mobile suit technology. Too bad there was no medical technology in there that could have cured space cancer, I guess. Currently, the ExaDB is stashed on an asteroid somewhere in the asteroid belt, and at one point, apparently, the Basidian pirates located it, but then lost it again. You know, Asamu is kind of a shitty pirate. I mean, he literally found the greatest booty in the world, and then he lost it somehow. Zehart and another Vagan commander named Zanald attack the D.Va, but it's mostly a ruse to steal the Gundam Age 3. At first, Kyo is saved by Flit, who's willing to sacrifice himself to let the D.Va get away, but when Kyo hears this, he can't let his grandfather go, so he returns to the battlefield and is immediately captured. Asamu contacts the D.Va and tells Flit that he has the manpower to mount a rescue and wants to go after Kyo. Flit gets incredibly pissed off at him and says that Asamu is dead to him, and it takes Madorna's wife telling Asamu that Kyo is his son and he needs to stop being a deadbeat and go rescue him. Like, come on Asamu, you should have rolled up in here and told Flit that you're gonna go rescue Kyo and that he could suck it. You seem like a scared little kid instead of a feared pirate, but I suppose that's sort of the point. Kyo is taken all the way to Mars to the main colony of the Vagan, Second Moon. He meets Ezelkent, and we learn that Kyo looks remarkably similar to Ezelkent's deceased son. Ezelkent wants to show Kyo how much the Vagan people have suffered, and explains the history of the colonies and how they have to live with the constant threat of sickness. You know, this might come off better if Ezelkent didn't uh, live in a giant lavish palace. Kyo is left to his own devices and is allowed to go around the city to, like, see how depressing it all is, and he even meets a dying orphan named Lou and her brother Dean. We even get a sappy song and montage as the couple hit it off and become friends. Unfortunately for everyone involved, Lou up and dies of Mars cancer so that Keo can have some skin in the game. The subplot is fine, I guess, but it does feel pretty emotionally manipulative to throw a dying orphan on screen in order to kind of balance out the genocide. The Basidian pirates use some stolen Vagan stealth tech to sneak right up to the colony, and Asamu is able to rescue Keo, taking him to the hangar to retrieve the Gundam Age 3. Ezelkin shows up in a vagan built Gundam to stop Kyo from leaving and explains his true plan. Ezelkin doesn't just want to take over the Earth for the vagan people. Essentially, he wants to create a world where only the strong survive. He believes that even if there were peace between the Federation and the vagan, war would inevitably erupt again. So he pretty much wants to use eugenics to populate Earth with only the strongest people. Ezelkin argues with Kyo until he almost kills him, but he can't bring himself to shoot someone who looks just like his son, Romy, remembering that Romy's dying wish was to be reborn on Earth. 
The Basidian pirates and Keo are able to escape through some giant balloon trickery and head back to the Earth Sphere to prepare for the final battle. Asimu finally reunites with Romery and is like, hey, sorry for being a deadbeat dad for the last 13 years. He explains that when he went on that mission all those years ago, he was attacked by a mysterious mobile suit and knocked out. He was then saved by the pirates and learned the story of the ExaDB and the Vagan colonies while healing. And this led him to abandon the Federation because he could no longer see the Vagan as demons. He then decides to lead the Basidian pirates in an effort to attack both the Federation and Vagan in order to keep both sides in check. Not really a great explanation for being completely absent from your son's life and faking your own death, but there you go. The Age 3 is rebuilt into the Age FX, and damn, this, this suit is slick. I really like the design of all the Age suits. Once you get into the art style, I think they do a good job of being detailed but still blocky enough to look like a Saturday morning cartoon. The FX has funnels, which, as we all know, are one of the coolest things in Gundam and is specifically designed to utilize Kyo's X-Rounder powers to their fullest. The Federation fights a battle to take back a base on the moon. The Vagan were able to take control due to the actions of the moon base's commander and an ace pilot named Gerard Spriggan. Both traitors to the Federation, they now fight for the Vagan, and this leads Keo to try and understand Gerard's story, because every time there's an older woman in his life, she commits treason, I guess. We get a flashback to Gerard's backstory where her fiancé died while they were both test pilots for the Federation, then his death was covered up and made to look like it was his fault. Now, Gerard takes her old lover's name and swears revenge on the Federation. And it's a fine story in and of itself, but like, introducing a new character and giving her an entire episode for a backstory only to kill her off a few episodes later, it's a rather annoying choice. Compounding upon that annoying choice is the fact that Keo has actually become rather annoying himself ever since being saved from the Vagan. I understand his decision to now disarm the enemy instead of kill them, and he's skilled enough to be able to do that pretty much any time he wants. But Keo is now near constantly getting in the way of allies and shouting about how the traitors must have had a good reason to leave the Federation. The reason this is so grating coming from Keo is because he is stuck in a very naive space that he never really evolves out of. Yes, Keo, they all had a great reason for leaving the Federation, but the suggestion that everyone just stop fighting and go home while the Vagan are attempting to kill 80% of the population in a eugenics-inspired genocide, well, it's, it's beyond naive. Plus, every other Fetty character sees Keo disarm suits and they're always like, Oh, wow, he's fighting in his own way! Like, disarming enemy suits is this profound idea that no one could ever have thought of. What can I say? It, that just really annoys me. The Federation assault isn't going well, so Algrius tells Flit that if they cannot take the base in the next 20 minutes, they're going to use a weapon called a Plasma Diver Missile to completely destroy the base. Flit and Keo fight Spriggan, and Keo keeps trying to get through to her, even though her X-Rounder powers are going crazy. Flit ends up killing her at the last second before she blasts Keo. Sarek's team infiltrates the base on foot and hacks into the intercom system, telling them that they only have a few minutes until the Plasma Diver destroys them all. The Vagan soldiers believe them and surrender, and the episode ends with the Vagan colony of Second Moon arriving in the Earth Sphere. Which brings up a lot of questions about Ezelkin's plan. Uh, like, if Second Moon can just move from planet to planet, why don't they just move it away from Mars so they stop getting sick from the Mars rays? Move it to Jupiter. It's not like Gundam hasn't had Jupiter colonies before. Sure, like, they usually all go crazy or turn into mutants or something, but it's better than whatever you guys had going on. Hell, just roll up to Earth with the entire damn colony and spill the beans about the Federation abandoning the colonies all those years ago. What are they going to do about it? It just makes Ezelkin seem more evil that he, he chooses to go through with this entire war when he could have just moved the colony around somewhere else.
It also makes Zayhart seem kind of stupid when he confronts Ezel Kent about the Eden plan, and then not only does the Vagan leader admit to the whole thing, but Zayhart believes him wholeheartedly and decides it's a good idea. So now there isn't really a single sympathetic Vagan character, unless you want to throw another dying orphan on screen for a bit. So, with the lull in the fighting, both Zayhart and Asimu decide they need to find the Exa DB. Zayhart is made Supreme Commander of the Vagan Forces by Ezelkent, who is dying of Mars Sickness. He is given the Gundam Legillus, which is also a great design up there with the rest of the Gundams in the series in my opinion. Zayhart heads to the asteroid belt and runs into a huge mobile armor that has basically been spawned out of the Exa DB. What the Exa DB actually is is pretty nebulous, as we're told it's just a cache of technological information, but hey, it builds a mobile suit, so perhaps it is similar to the age device. Asimu shows up to help defeat the giant mech named Sid. He left without telling Flit about the Exa DB, as he believes his father would use it to turn the tide of the war. Pretty telling that Flit is still into the whole, like, let's exterminate the Vagan thing. The Sid keeps disappearing by using stealth tech, so Asimu attaches the Darkhound's hook hands to it and has Zayhart fire where the wires lead. Zayhart then tries to stop Asimu from destroying the Exa DB, and he literally has a god complex at this point. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, uh, Zayhart keeps like asking Ezelkent if he's a god who gets to decide who lives and dies, and Ezelkent will be like, No, you are not a god, you are the light whatever whatever that means it just it just screams of a rushed reason for Zayhart turning evil at the last second the exa db ends up being bombarded by the basidian ship and asimu and Zayhart both leave intact though we see a chunk of the sid mech and the exa db still remain the federation finally gathers its entire fleet to attack the vegan space fortress legramis which is now being backed up by the colony second moon the age 3 now has a new mode called fx burst which is essentially the suit going super saiyan but keo refuses to use it because it might kill someone the Vagan fire the huge Legramis laser and destroy a big chunk of the Federation fleet, and Keo is shocked that they would resort to that for some reason, like they haven't been indiscriminately killing civilians for 60 years. Sarek, the commander of the Divas mobile suits and Captain Natora's lover now, gets smacked into a Vagan ship and uh, gets completely stuck, so the Diva has to fire on him in order to clear the way to the fortress, thus showing Natora's growth and willingness to make sacrifices. Dean shows up and fights Keo. After Lou died, he joined the X-Rounder Corps, and Keo cries a whole bunch before Zanald shows up and just kills Dean for no reason. Keo activates the FX Burst mode, and it's pretty awesome, actually. He almost kills Zanald, but stops when he realizes what he's doing. Zaydhard has Legramis power up and begin its firing sequence, even though a bunch of his own forces are in the way, fully cementing him as an evil megalomaniac. I mean, he even sees a vision of all the people that have died for him throughout the series telling him to do anything to achieve Eden, and I can't help but believe this is just him convincing himself. When Flit realizes what Zayhart is doing, he decides to abandon the D.Va, using it as a decoy and getting the crew aboard the Basidian ship. When Zayhart realizes that the Gundams escaped, he goes out himself and is confronted by Asimu, who absolutely rocks his shit but stops just short of killing him. Look at you, Asimu, you used to be so afraid of X-Rounders, and now here you are, stomping an X-Rounder Gundam, and all it took was you not talking to your son. Ever. Zayhart has a lengthy conversation with Asimu, and reveals that his original dream was to live with his friend and raise a family. Then, Zayhart blows up. The joke's on him, because Asimu abandoned his family. Also, I love that he's like... My original dream was to live like you and raise a happy family, but then I went with plan B and killed everybody. With Zayhart dead, the Vagan commander decides to use his final gambit, a huge suit called the Vagan Gear, piloted by a fucking clone of Ezelkent that has been modified for combat named Zira Gins. I really do not like this being thrown into the final episode. Why not just have Zayhart be the big bad until the end? You've already committed to him being evil, so... 
Or hell, have the Sid mech be the big bad guy at the end that everyone has to defeat. Because surprise, it shows back up anyway and interrupts everything in the final moments. Gins goes bananas and fights the Sid, slamming into the Gramus and damaging it so badly that it's going to explode. Which seems like a really terrible design for a space fortress if blowing up one of its fuel containers explodes the entire thing. Flit finally lets his genocidal tendencies boil over and grabs the plasma diver missile from the episode with the moon base, and he says that the war will never be over unless he kills every vegan, including all the women and children. And then he threatens to blow up second moon with the missile. And you could probably tell I'm smiling while saying that because it is the most ridiculous and evil thing that a Gundam protagonist has ever threatened to do. Everyone tries to talk him down, and it takes Urin's ghost showing up and telling him to, like, fucking chill out. I will say, it is nice to see young Flit again during this moment when he has some self-reflection. Flit decides not to kill everyone, and all the Fetty suits work together with the Vigan to cut away the exploding pieces of Legramis so that second moon isn't damaged. Keo uses the burst mode to defeat the Vagan gear once and for all, and he even saves the insane clone from the explosion. Ezelkin contacts Keo telepathically and thanks him for saving the colony, and tells him that he leaves the Earth to Keo, and then he dies of space cancer. We finally get an incredibly abrupt ending with an older Keo and Asimu checking out a statue of Flit. And we learn that the Exit DB was used to go on and purify the atmosphere of Mars. So apparently that was something that they could have done. Too bad Ezelkin didn't find that part of the Exit DB all those years ago. Instead, he found the instructions for building giant death robots. The series comes to a close, and uh, it's not the best entry into the Gundam franchise, but it certainly is an interesting experiment. At the end of the day, I do think that the Asimu arc in the middle is the best part of the whole show. It's the closest to a regular Gundam show, really, besides maybe the first part, which is basically a remake of Mobile Suit Gundam. Unfortunately, they do... Uh, kind of ruin Asimu's character, in my opinion, by making him a deadbeat dad pirate that is also still a giant pussy and needs to ask his daddy Flit for permission to rescue his own son. Um, so I wish they didn't do that. And again, they spent way too much time trying to humanize the Vagan in the final arc right before the big ending battle because, shit, we've spent... 40 episodes showing how these genocidal crazy aliens are going around blowing up everything. And while yes, it's bad that Flit is like, let's kill everybody, let's kill all the Vagan, including the women and the children, to the point where he's got a giant nuke missile that he's pointing at the colony. That's also bad. Um, <laughs> but to try and humanize the Vagan by putting, hey, hey, look, they have dying orphans. They have cancer orphans on their colony. Don't you feel bad for them? The answer is not really. Uh, that was, It was just kind of a cheap attempt to get me to, like, understand their plight. And it doesn't really work because you've made them too evil by that point. You give Zayhart a, go a, a literal god complex. You make Ezelkin a scary... Uh, 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 Hitler style uh, uh, dictator that cryogenically freezes himself so he can lead his people forever and it just the showing me that they have sad orphans doesn't erase the, the literal millions of people they killed so it, 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 the attempt to humanize them at the end kind of pisses me off and of course honestly I should have expected it because no Gundam will ever just do one side's good one side's bad uh I just wish that they had done a better job, <laughs> I guess. So, wow, ooh, that was uh, a bit of off-the-cuff uh, uh, stuff at the end. Uh, anyway, I really do hope that you enjoyed this second part of Gundam Age. Uh, the review is now done. I know I said it was going to be out earlier, but um, silly me. I forgot that Thanksgiving makes you busy, so... That threw a wrench into that. Anyway, we'll see you again next week. Same 
Gundam time, same Gundam channel. Okay, bye. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome to the end card today. If you made it this far, thank you very much for watching till the end of the video. As you know, watch time is giant on YouTube, so I definitely appreciate it. We are going to thank today's channel members, aka Batosai, Argent, Griever, Asher, Kazar, Brian Sanchez, D. Mills, Daniel Johnson, Detter V, Dilla Soul 22, Gert, Joe Castellanos, Joe Cavazos, John Lamb, Johnny G, Canto 20, McLean Nugent, Mr. Smash, Zappa Slave, Video Gamer 75, and Trey Hardy. Thank you guys very much. It's always super appreciated. Um, again, thank you for watching all the way to the end of the video. If you got this far, I know it took forever for this half to come out, but it's literally double the length <laughs> of part one. And um, yeah, I totally forgot that like Thanksgiving was coming around and making me busy so there we go on on the bright side though i have like most of the work done for the gasaraki video and a, a lot of stuff done for the giver already and then also another video that i'm planning so uh there's still going to be a good amount of content before the end of the year and then going into 2024 i think you guys are going to like a lot of what's going to go on. So again, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you next time.